Hmm. So I can mail it to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, it's just a question of converting them uh, from MP4 to MP3. It takes a little bit of a just 20 minutes at a time, but you know what I mean. I I, I have to get some some desk time, and as Joy Joy's been doing a little part time work with us, and she'll tell you that I'm kind of scatterbrains. Um, I'm running around putting out fires usually. So, at any rate, but uh, I've heard that you all were uh, were rescuing a puppy yesterday or the other day on Friday, yeah. maybe. Yeah, that that stuff too, right? <laughs> Being a neighbor. <laughs> Okay, now we want to begin with um, chapter five, and we, there is a, we, we've moved largely from the doctrinal part of his letter to the pastoral com slash communal life part of, of Ephesians, okay? And most of Paul's letters have this structure. They start out with some doctrinal statements and, and teachings, and then they move into community living, basically, which means family, but it, it's wider than just family, okay? Now, he gives a principle here that he wants to develop in, in chapter five, simply this. Oh, am I recording? Let me make sure. Yes, I am. I'm sorry. Um, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Okay, be imitators of God as beloved children. In other words, be a chip off the old block, my father would say, you know? Uh, hey, you're a pope, and popes don't fail math. You know, we're going to get you a tutor, you know, that kind of a thing. But uh, be a chip off the old block, you know? And um, so to be imitators of God, why? Because, you see, we don't just have... You know, people sometimes say to me, and it, 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 they don't mean to be annoying me, but they, well, after all, we're only human. No, we're not. Not if we're baptized, right? We share not just in, you know, our human nature, but, our, but we have a, a share in the divine nature. We have supernatural gifts that are offered to us. So we can act over and above and, and, and uh, in opposition to our sinful, you know, drives. We have this capacity. Now, it's one thing to say I have it, another thing to lay hold of it and really begin to live it and access it. But nevertheless, don't don't try to banish that phrase. After all, we're only human. You know, try to banish that from your uh, vocabulary because um, it's just not true. We're not just if we're baptized, we're not simply human. We're a member of the body of Christ. We have supernatural virtues, faith, hope, and charity. Um, uh, even, even the natural virtues, prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude can be elevated to supernatural levels by, by the grace of God at work within us. So, and you see, well, you say, well, how do you know this? Well, the proof would be the saints, right? Uh, the heroic virtues we see in their lives and, you know, okay. So a lot of us poor slobs never quite, you know, get there, but, um, you know, they're, they're, they're varsity and we're, we're, we're a bunch of, we're just a bunch of, we're, we're, we're not even varsity. We're playing out in the backyard. You know, we're, you know, we're playing, we're playing touch football out in the backyard or something, but compared to them, but nevertheless, the point is that God can and does, and he gives us examples, countless examples of the saints, and he perfects us, okay? So, the imitators of God, okay? Too many people think, well, at least I'm not like a prostitute over there, or like that drug dealer over there. Well, I'm sorry, that's not the standard, the standard isn't to be better than a prostitute or a drug dealer. The standard is to be like Jesus. So we welcome you, Stephanie. Um, welcome. Okay, now, by the way, we're in Ephesians 5. That's where we are, okay? It says here, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up. Now, notice again, walk in love. Love. I love everybody. I am a lover of all humanity, you know. You know, this kind of, or, um, you know, the 60s, the psychedelic era, you know, love is a many splendid thing. Um, um, you know, or this idea of um, how can anything be wrong if we love each other? You know, that kind of stuff, you know, a lot of vague, vague stuff with love. So you notice that Paul if loving you is wrong. I don't want to be right. All right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. That sounds like a song. From uh, uh, was it Patty Labelle? Who who sang that? I don't know. You remember yeah. who sang it? 
Mm-hmm. Okay. All righty. Well, anyway, um, but again, notice how he links love here to sacrificial love. So Christ loved, the, you know, it would be imitators of Christ as he loved us. And he says it gave himself up for us. This Greek word here is paradidomi, which always refers to the crucifixion in the, in the Greek New Testament. Okay. Paradidomi. He gave himself over for us. All right. And um, notice this idea of a fragrant offering. Um, let's be honest, in the ancient temple, with all these animals being slaughtered and thrown onto a, you know, parts of their bodies being thrown up onto a fire, it was a pretty stinky place. A lot of blood, a lot of, uh, you know. So what did they do to cover it? Uh, lots of incense. Lots of incense. And that fragrant aroma is the idea. So when you go to church, you'll see that we use incense today, at least for maybe more special masses. And um, we, um, it's a fragrant aroma. And let the Bible says, let my prayer rise like incense in, in the book of Psalms. The lifting up of my hand is an evening offering. So the idea of this fragrant aroma would be the, it would have evoke the incense in the temple. You ever go into a church um, and you smell candle burning, you know, like uh, candle wax in the air, or you smell uh, incense that's, you know, maybe from an earlier mass or something. And the idea is you, you sort of sense the holy, right? So, you know, I, I, <laughs> I lost my sense of smell 10 years ago. I have none. I can look at incense and see it, but not smell it. Isn't that crazy? I just, I just went completely nose blind. You know, I had a head injury and I never got my sense of smell back. So, but for those of you who can smell, <laughs> you walk into a church and there's a sort of aroma, at least in the old days when we burned real candles, you could smell the candles in the air and you could smell the you know, lingering incense and other things like that. So, That's because there was so many in the church. They was, they yeah. were quite right. a few now in our parish we still we still actually burn traditional candles but most parishes have gone i i if you're going to go to these electronic candles just don't use them at all come on they're literally fueled by cold hard cash and um you know this idea of uh electronic you know candles you see here's the concept of a candle pay, pay attention it's a burnt offering you take an expensive thing maybe two three four dollars worth of candle wax and you just waste it you just burn it send it up to god it's a it's a it's a, it's a um it's a burnt offering okay you don't have re reusable see when the thing is burnt up it's gone it's gone you know no one else can come behind you and relight it see so the idea is that uh, it burns until it's done and it's gone and then it's discarded whatever remains uh, maybe a glass or some other maybe metal thing that held it. But at the end of the day, it's a burnt offering, okay? And that's the idea of a candle, okay? All right, um, any comments or questions? Because we're going to get into the thick of it here now because he's going to get very specific with us, right? Okay. Now, here we come to a problem again of whatever translation that you are using, Okay. Uh, I'm just going to pull open my, oh, uh, my, um, I'm going to pull open my uh, ESV because the translation that I am currently using is the RSV, but I want to see what the OS, I mean, the, the, the um, English standard, the ESV, the English standard version does with this. Uh, there is a word here that I think is translated much too vaguely in both the RSV and the New American Bible. Okay, good. They handle it better. I'm moving over to the ESV. Now, it says here, but as for, this is verse uh, three now I'm in, okay? But as for sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness, let this not even be named among you as proper among the saints. No filthiness, foolish talk, crude joking, all of this is out of place, but instead give thanks. And you can be sure of this, that anyone who is sexually immoral or impure or covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now, uh, hmm. some texts say just, um, but immorality must not even be named among you. Immorality, 
You know, that can mean anything, right? See, but the Greek word here is pornea. This is where we get the word pornography. Okay, so we're not dealing with some just general immorality. We're dealing with a specific form of immorality here where Paul is talking about sexual immorality, okay? Uh, sometimes pornea uh, was translated in older things like the King James as fornication, right? Fornication. Fornication would be like things like premarital sex or other illicit sexual activities uh, to those who are not married. Uh, adultery, mokea in the Greek is, is re refers to again, the breaking of a marriage bond as well as you know being you know with someone outside of marriage but where one or both of you is married to someone else and that's called adultery right and uh, now homosexuality the word homosexuality was coined in the 1800s so you're not going to find the word a greek word for homosexuality but the 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 um the act is described for example, in the book of Leviticus, if a man lies with a man as with a woman, uh, he must be put to death. It is an abomination to God, you know, or uh, it'll say, um, um, for, for example, in Romans chapter one, Paul refers to homosexuality as parafisin, contrary to acts that are con sexual acts that are contrary to nature. <coughs> um, <clears throat> so again, um, so we have these different words for sexual, sexual acts or things that are uh, that are contrary to God's will for us. Okay, fornication, adultery, and homosexual acts. But the word you won't find a word. You say, oh, like well, man, the word homosexual never appears in the Bible. Well, because it was invented in the night in the eighteen sixties, dummy. But it's described, it's very clearly described, right? Um, sometimes uh, there's references to boy prostitutes and to, um, to um, you know, these types of things. So the acts are described. Uh, sadly, it's pretty vivid sometimes, you know? Um, and um, the, um, but it is certainly very clearly, in fact, the fact that it is described makes no doubt about what's being discussed, okay? Now, um, um, by the way, some people say, well, Jesus never mentioned homosexuality. Well, he never mentioned rape either. So are we prepared to say that since Jesus never mentioned rape, that rapes, you know, Jesus is like really cool with rape? He never mentioned it, right? I mean, so you see the idea. I mean, um, the idea that Jesus never mentioned something is an argument from silence. It's a bad argument. It's a weak argument, okay? Now, the apostles certainly do. And here we are back to this now. All right. Um, it says here again, but as for sexual immorality, the, the, this is their translation of porneia, fornication or sexual immorality. OK, or in all impurities, in other words, here bodily or sexual impurity or covetousness. Notice again, what is the 10th commandment? You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. So there's a kind of a covetousness that is more just generalized greed. But then there's a covetousness that is a desire for someone else's intimate, for, you know, in other words, in this case, their wife or husband. Now, uh, by the way, one of, people sometimes wonder, you know, I don't know if you know this or not, but the Protestant uh, enumeration of the commandments is different than the Catholic one. Are you aware of that? So it starts out right at the beginning where the Protestants divide the first commandment into two commandments. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Number two, you shall not carve graven images. Whereas in the Catholic tradition, not just the Catholic, but the Palestinian tradition, they were, they were even among the Jews, they would fold that into the first commandment. All worship of other gods is forbidden. And then you start the numeration, you know, uh, from there, you know, you shall keep uh, you shall not. Uh, um, you shall keep the name of the Lord your God holy. You shall keep the cup, the sack, the um, uh, the Sabbath holy. Uh, honor your father and mother. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not steal. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. I mean your neighbor's goods, or you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. Now some people say, well, why aren't those put together? 
And the answer is that the, the Hebrew word is actually different, even though we translate them the same in most English translations. The, 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 the Hebrew word that's translated covet in both commandments is a different Hebrew word. So that the Hebrew word you shall not covet your neighbor's wife is you shall not lustfully desire her. Okay. Now that doesn't mean it's only a problem for men, it, you know, but it, you, you get the idea. It said, it's said to represent, you know, both, both sexes. Okay. So uh, all that said, let's get back again to the text. Um, he says here simply sexual immorality or all impurity or covetousness must not be named among you as is proper among the saints. Now, let there be no filthiness. Um, filthiness is, again, you know, lewd behaviors, lewd dancing, grunge dancing, whatever you want to call it, uh, lewd behavior, um, dressing in hot pants, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> you know, just making it up as I go. Uh, no filthiness, foolish talk. Um, some of the translations say off-color humor, where you take sexuality and you... Um, you turn it into the brunt of jokes. You know, I don't know how Chris Rock gets along with his wife or not, but man, what a filthy thing, he, what filthy things he says about his wife. You know, what she does and won't do and all this kind of, you know, and I, 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 mean, I mean, she's probably crying all the way to the bank, you know, but- uh, Quite a few of them do that. They, they, yeah. they all do that now. Yeah, this terrible, turning of sexuality into the brunt of jokes and this kind of stuff. So that's, that's what's going on here in the translation comes to us again, you know, this idea of, you know, foolish talk, but really it means scurrilous. Scurrilous it usually means, you know, again, where we take something sacred like human sexuality or the things of God or the things of intimacy and love and marriage, and we just trot them out as some kind of bunch of foolishness, you see. Um, talk to my wife, man, she blah, 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 you know, and you're like, ooh, you shouldn't be telling us that, you know, all right, nor crude joking, again, where we turn sex into a joke, okay, These, this is all out of place, but instead, let there be thanksgiving, in other words, thank God for your wife, thank God for your husband, um, uh, you know, if you're not married, prepare to get married and, 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 and stay focused and stay chaste and pure. Thank God for marriage. Okay. Thank God for celibacy, you know, for that some of us have adopted. Um, but, but thank God and, and thank God for this beautiful gift through which the world is enriched with new children. Marriage is, is, is upheld. And, and um, also we see that uh, celibacy and other forms of, of this giving of one's sexuality over to God and, 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 and to becoming totally devoted to the church. These, give thanks for these things. Be, be grateful, be thankful, be reverent at something that is deeply holy. Why is it deeply holy? Because it is through this that new human beings, immortal souls, destined to live for all eternity, we hope in heaven, God forbid hell. But this is... This is a significant, holy, powerful, and life-altering, literally life-originating, but also life-altering activity. And people just frivolously go around and uh, have sex and make it casual and the stuff of jokes. And you see, and this is a terrible thing because this is really tied very deeply to the dignity of every human person, all right? Whatever your mother or father said, you were not a surprise. You were not a, um, a mistake. <laughs> you, you were intentionally willed by God. And he created you in, the, in, that, in that marital act, even if sadly the couple wasn't married. Um, God has, this is a very sacred thing, you see, and it should be treated that way. So things like thanksgiving, reverence, a sense of the holiness of human sexuality is, is what we're called to have, okay? All right. Now then, he goes on here and makes a warning. Um, it says here that, um, uh, verse, verse five now, for you can be sure of this, and, and anyone who is sexually immoral or impure or covetous, covetous 
it in effect an idolater has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. You know, uh, some of these, uh, some of the translations say, in effect, an idolater. One, one who is covet. Remember, the covetousness that's being spoken of here is a sexual covetousness, where a man is coveting his neighbor's wife, or a woman is coveting her neighbor's husband. And um, it, it then equates it with idolatry. Now, but you can see that in our times, many people treat sex almost like an idol. In fact, um, our, our world is so obsessed with sex and the necessity of it that it, 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 it simply almost blocks out any limits to people's free sexual expression as if, if, you can't, if you can't permit them to just freely express themselves sexually, you somehow canceled their whole life and identity. Really? You see, I mean, sex is part of life, but it's not life. And I, I, I'm not a sexually active person, haven't been for decades and decades and never, you know, really never in a certain sense. I mean, I, I, um, I dated and did a few things, but I mean, at the end of the day, you know, once I ended the seminary, I've never been inappropriate with anybody ever, not even once as God is my witness. Now, I shouldn't have to say that to you, but sadly today, I need to reassure you, okay? But I'm just going to say right now... Um, you know, I have a happy life. I have a fulfilled life. There's more to life than having sex. But there are many people who think, oh my gosh, you, you can't deny anybody their right to have sex with anybody in any way at any time uh, with anyone, no matter what, because you're, you're just like ruining their life, man. And you can see the idolatry that starts to set up here. So this word idolatry is strong, but it is a very common idolatry that people have that my whole life really depends on, you know, having lots of sex or on my terms or, and I, I just can't be happy unless I can do that. Now, of course, if that were the case, I suppose, you know, shouldn't, if sex were a source for happiness, shouldn't people running around with a lot of people today with all this, you know, promiscuity in our culture, shouldn't people all be running around with a big grin on their face all day, you know? But of course, that, that's the lie. It, it, it's part of life. It has its ups and downs. I've never been part of this experience, but I, I know from counseling married couples and others that it's part of life. But Father, it's, it gets boring too. You know, It's not like the be all and end all of our marriage. There's more to life than this uh, activity. And somehow or another, um, it has good time. We have some good experiences and some bad ones and some fulfilling ones and some embarrassing ones, you know, it's just, it's like life. Okay. So don't turn this stuff into an idol, but that is where most of our modern world is today. See? All right. Okay. Um, now, uh, notice again, it says, you can be sure of this, that anyone who is this has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Translation. If you are an unrepented fornicator or adulterer, I'm talking about unrepented now. I'm not saying you fell once and you got, you got up and you said, help me, Lord, or you struggle with some weakness, but you know it's wrong and you come to him and ask his mercy. But those who shake their fist and say, there's nothing wrong with fornication or adultery or whatever the heck I want to do, they will go to hell. They will go to hell. They have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. No, none. That's strong, right? And I could tell you 20 other places in the New Testament where this very language is used. People make light of sexual sin today. Um, but God doesn't. Now, God, oh, yeah, your God is just trying to take away our fun, man. I mean, he's just like so down on like, you know. Okay, why would God care about things like this? Well, first of all, because he cares about children. And children need good, strong family life, good, strong marriages. Marriage depends on purity and self-control. So in effect, God is trying to protect us. You know, he says, you know, that sexual immorality brings a lot of grief, a lot of pain. It, it ruins marriage. It undermines marriage. For example, look at our time. And again, I can't begin to tell you how many young, very attractive women have told me that men don't even ask them out on dates in these days. You know, they're all stuck in pornography or God knows what else. 
Um, why get married, you know, if you can get this stuff outside of marriage? So in a promiscuous culture, it's no surprise that marriage rates have plummeted and that marriages are very easily, um, of, uh, you know, people end up in divorce court very quickly and very easy for lots of reasons. But among them, because, um, uh, I don't know, maybe a certain husband doesn't think his wife is enough of a porn queen, you know, and um uh, she's not willing to just, you know, meet any of his needs and crazy stuff he wants to do. There could be any number of reasons, but but it, sexual immorality attacks marriage at its root because sexual intimacy is a prerogative of marriage. The bu book of Hebrews says, let the marriage bed be honored in every way, for God will judge fornicators and adulterers. Because again, it undermines marriage. Marriage has prerogatives. Now, one of the real goals in a, in a society that's up and running properly is that you do restrict sexual intimacy to marriage. And many good up and running cultures do a pretty good job of enforcing this. Not perfect, but a pretty good job. So that if you're caught living together outside of marriage or committing adultery or um, uh, fornicating in, in some kind of, you're, 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 there are punitive measures that come upon you. People don't tolerate this kind of stuff in an up and running culture. They may not live it perfectly, but they don't tolerate it or call it good or okay or no big deal. After all, you got to try on a shoe before you buy it. Crap, you know, so that's, that kind of stuff, you know, that we get, you know, um, as if a woman or a man were a shoe for heaven's sakes, you know? So, uh, okay. But the idea here is that um, good, healthy cultures do a pretty good job of policing this, you know? Um, I remember even in, in I, I kind of came at the end of an era, but I mean, even as a teenager in the 70s, you know, we were expected to um, usually be uh, chaperoned at dances and other things. There was a lot of oversight. And that, like when I got a little bit older and could ask a girl out on a date, I was expected to have her home at a reasonable hour. And uh, by God, if her father found out I was messing around or doing something wrong, he'd He'd come after me. He'd be talking to my father, and um, so I think that there were a lot of things in place. Remember the the old the old colleges were often men and women's colleges, but even if they were mixed, the women's dorm we had a well, not a police officer, but a but a docent down there at the bottom, and, you, and men just didn't get up into women's dorms. And this idea of mixed dorms and all this foolishness in college today it just was unthinkable in those years. So we did a much better job as a culture in saying this type of activity is bad, it's wrong, it'll harm you, it's not tolerable, do not do it. And if you do it, we'll have to, there'll be some sanctions. Whereas today it's like, hey man, none of my business, man. So we start to see what happens. Will marriage rates plummet? Divorce rates skyrocket? We see children being born out of wedlock. Now abortions have skyrocketed. 85% of abortions are performed on single women, which means a man and a woman fornicated. Okay, so the first risk of fornication is that the child will be outright murdered, killed. And then beyond that, even the 15% that survive are born into largely irregular situations that aren't, that aren't balanced or as healthy. And uh, thank God they survived, but it's going to be a lot tougher, see? And uh, every child deserves a parent, a mother and a father who've committed themselves to a lifelong relationship who will be there for those children to manifest the masculine genius and the feminine genius of being human. And um, uh, every child deserves this. And to intentionally deprive a child of this through risky behaviors like fornication or adultery um, is, is to commit an injustice against them, you see? And the greatest injustice is that they're just outright murdered in abortion. And even, even if that isn't done, they're still, they have a lot a lot that they're going to have to struggle with. So we also see problems with venereal, well, we used to call them venereal diseases. If you're really old like me, you remember that. But now they call them sexually transmitted diseases. Okay. Um, we have those problems. We have broken hearts. We have women that feel used, abused, and set aside. When a man gets bored with her, you, we see all kinds of problems, you see. So God is trying to save us from a lot of heartache, a lot of trouble. He's trying to save us from disease. He's trying to save us from abortion, from the falling apart of our families, from the harm that this causes children. 
He's trying to save a lot of people from a lot of trouble. So he's not just trying to take away our fun. Are you praying with me? Okay. So the, these are not, you know, this is not just some uptight God or an uptight priest talking to you now who's really down on sex, you know. I mean, sex is a beautiful thing. In fact, I advise all newly married couples have a lot of sex, have a lot of children, and raise them all Catholic. Because once you're married, before one hour before you're married, sex is a lie. But one hour after you're married, because you the two have now become one, your sex is a beautiful sacramental kind of aspect of who you are as a couple. And um, it's true. It's the truth. It's not a lie. So it's true and it's beautiful, beautiful sign of who you are and what you become. So uh, this is because God says that they are no longer two. They are one flesh. And in this oneness, this unity, this intimacy, children come forth, you see, as the fruit of love. And that's the beautiful vision God has. All right. Maybe a couple more lines and I want to get some reactions. All right. <clears throat> Verse six. Let no one deceive you. In other words, carry you away <clears throat> with empty words. What's, what are empty words? Everybody's doing it, man. Like, come on, man. Come of age, man. You're living like in the old days, man. You know, pardon me for using my hippie accent, but, you know, I grew up with these people who talk like this, you know. Come on, dude, man. Come on, man. just smoke a little weed, man. You'll feel better about it, man. You know, and uh, so th this idea that um, um, empty arguments, everybody's doing it, you know, how come it's so bad? You know, um, how come I can't have it? You know, that, those are empty arguments, okay? Do not let anyone deceive you with empty arguments. Um, it goes on to say here, um, because of such things, the wrath of God comes down upon the sons of disobedience. Now, we've talked a lot in these Bible studies by now, even with some of your more recent entrance to my Bible studies, about the wrath of God. What is the wrath of God? God says, no, I'm really mad. I'm going to punch you in the nose, man. And I'm going to punish you and make your life miserable. And I don't, you know, is that the wrath of God? See? No. What is the wrath of God? Can anyone remember? Can anyone remember a good definition that I've given you before? I'll give you a little hint that the wrath of God is not in God. It's in us. Monsignor, would it be um, God's incompatibility with sin? So we can't have friendship with him. Yeah, you're on the right track there, Crystal. Basically, it is our experience of the total incompatibility of our sinful state before the holiness of God. It's like wax in front of a great fire. It's like water on the top of a hot stove. There's a conflict. You hear it. it can't, the two can't coexist. Um, so, uh, for example, water and, and fire, you hear the conflict. And if there's a lot of water and a little fire, out goes the fire. If there's a lot of fire and a little water, it just turns to steam and goes away. So either way, but they're not going to coexist. One's going to win, the other's going to lose. And so the idea is that a sinner cannot come before the holiness of God and experience anything but devastating heat and light that they cannot stand unless they repent and let God bring them up to the temperature of glory through the indwelling Holy Spirit and make their lights, their eyes used to the brilliant light of truth. Okay. So the wrath of God is our experience of the total incompatibility of God with, uh, with um, uh, our, in front of, in the midst of our sinfulness. Okay. Unrepented sinfulness understood. Okay. I've given you this analogy before, but think of a, of a light. I have a light up here now. Gosh, it's got to be 200 watts. I've got this very bright light. Um, but uh, I like it now. But if I were to turn that light on after getting up at five in the morning, you know, now did the light change? No, it's the same light it was right now. But I've gotten used to the darkness and I call the light harsh. I say the light is harsh, but the light's not harsh. The problem's in me. So you see, when we talk about the wrath of God, I want you to understand, it's, it's, God doesn't change. God is not moody. Okay, God is not vengeful in the sense that he wants to just beat us up and I'll tell you, I'll serve you right, that kind of stuff. 
That's not, uh, God is love. But you cannot come before God, who is love and truth, in, in a dark and unseemly state and think you're going to be able to endure. You're going to recoil and fall back. And you may say, well, God is harsh, but God is not harsh. You're just weak. You're, un, you're incapable of the light. You're incapable of the heat of his love. Okay? That's the wrath of God. Okay? So it's, it's hard to maybe remember. Thank you, Crystal. You, you picked up on it. You've been with me a long time now, at least uh, five or six years, huh? In these Bible studies. So, um, so again, that's what we mean here by the wrath of God. All right. So let me start to get some reactions from you, but let's just see if there's anything I need to finish. Um, no one deceive you with empty words, verse six. Um, because of such things, the wrath of God comes down upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. All right, let's stop. What are your questions, comments, rebuttals, concerns? Okay, you all are like really on board. Hey. Let me just tell you some of the concerns that people say. I mean, well, Father, are you saying that somebody who, you know, um, went through a period like when they were young, before they got married, and they were, you know, they were kind of sexually active, and eventually they kind of came to, they got married, and now they're living in, uh, it says, you know, are you saying they're going to go to hell? No, unless they haven't repented. Now, hopefully they've been to confession um, before that time. And hopefully, you know, they've, they've received God's mercy. If for some reason a person will say, well, I never confess any of those things because I never thought they were wrong. Well, then let's go. Let's, I'll put on my stool right now. <laughs> let's take care of that. But, but the point is that I think people, it's one, it, 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 I think we need to make a distinction between what we would call sins of weakness and sins of malice. Sins of weakness are those things where, you know, look, you know, I mean, I was not born yesterday. And, you know, when you really love somebody, it's hard to keep your hands off them. And, you know, sometimes you go too far and, and um, you know, all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, you say, well, there's something wrong. I need to go to confession. This isn't right. And you're repentant, you know. And, and, and um, even if there's kind of a recurring problem every now and again, it's one thing to say, okay, well, I, but I know it's wrong and I need to go to God. And, and let's get this marriage thing done soon. <laughs> You know, uh, because it's the same Paul said it's better to marry than to burn. You know, there was burn with lust. So he kind of recommends marriage for those who struggle with chastity. Um, St. Augustine calls rem marriage a remedy for concupiscence, right? So, um, but at the end of the day, um, what's most troubling, and we unfortunately have a lot of this today, this, this clenched fist, I will not be told what to do. Get your rosaries off my ovaries and your Bible out of my bedroom. And by God, get lost. I will not be told what to do. There's nothing wrong with this, even though deep down, they know better. I, you know, I have never had a couple come to me prepared, who's preparing for marriage, and I find out they're living together, and I call them on it. They know. They know it's wrong. Oh, I've never heard of this, Father. This doesn't make any sense. Really? There's something wrong with this? They all know. They know. And um, um, so I advised them. I say, well, look, you know, you, you, you know, you're going to have to appear before God one day. And so am I. And I need to tell you, this is not pleasing to God that you're doing this. And I want you to stop. And I want you to try to stay chaste before your marriage. And, you know, I've had a lot of couples really work with me on that. And they say, you know, Father, you're right. And, um, you know, we, want, we don't want to violate the very institution that we're preparing to enter into. Marriage has prerogatives. And you know, I usually take this very passage from Ephesians and I read it to them and I say, I don't want you to go to hell, you know? Um, and uh, so why don't you try to try your very best? And if you do fall through weakness, get to confession, but don't go on calling good or no big deal what God calls sin. Would you please agree with me at least there? Yes, Father. I've only had one couple ever get up and walk out of me. I'm 33 years of priest. I've only had one couple get up and walk out of me, uh, walk out on me saying, you know, you're just a foolish old fashioned priest. We'll go find some Jesuit. He won't ask any questions, you know. But um, um, my point is that at most couples, they understand. They're willing to work with me and they're willing to try. And even if they fall, they know they're going to go to confession, you know. But, but this idea of just making light of it is though it's no big deal. But this clenched fist and not just obviously about fornication, in other words, premarital sex or living together outside of marriage, but all these things now with homosexual acts that are not just 
you know, the people literally celebrate them, you know, um, or, or now we see all kinds of weird other sexual practices. And by the way, it isn't unique to homosexuals. I mean, some heterosexuals engage in very unnatural sexual practices that are, that render the, the act sterile. And um, so all of these are ways of saying that somewhere along the line, we have to at least accept the fact that even if you struggle, at least say I am struggling, but it is wrong. Um, so I think that the fornicator, fornicators will not inherit the kingdom of heaven, particularly prefer, refers to those who are unrepentant, who are angry, who will not be told what to do. Okay, fine. I won't tell you what to do, says the Lord. You do whatever you want, and I'll tell you where it's going to lead. Okay? Because in heaven, we value chastity. And if you don't want chastity, you don't have to have it, and you don't have to have the heaven where it's celebrated. Okay? And that's how it works, all right? Well, we're really making a lot of progress here. Let's keep moving. You didn't have a lot of questions, so I'll move on, okay? But hold, you know, you know, if any of these things make you think, you know, we could talk about them as we go. All right, now, um, verse 8. For at one time you were in darkness, but now you are in the light of the Lord. So walk as children of the light, for the light... Uh, the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord and take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful to even speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed to the light, it becomes visible for anything that becomes visible is light. Now, Jesus said in John 3, he said, here is the judgment that the light has come into the world, but many prefer the darkness because their deeds are wicked and they fear that the light will expose their deeds. So um, they don't come near the light because the light will expose their deeds. But you see, what is it saying? It's saying deep down, they know it's wrong. They know. You know, we, we do have a problem, I think, today with poor catechesis, with poor conscience formation. But ultimately, there's something very deep down. St. Thomas actually calls it cinderesis, or sometimes people pronounce it cinderesis. It's, it's, it's just that those deep principles that we know deep down are wrong. Like, I shouldn't be stealing things that don't belong to me. I, I, I shouldn't be hateful. Uh, and harm other people's lives. Um, I shouldn't, you know, be having, you know, illicit sexual union. I, I shouldn't be defaming people or stealing or taking things, uh, dishonoring people in authority. People have a basic instinct about these basic moral norms that are rooted in the Ten Commandments. It's called the natural law. Now, it's not the law of nature. The natural law is that part of God's law that is available to anyone with an intellect. Okay, we can basically know, look, running around and just when I get angry, just venting my anger and murdering people, that's not good. That doesn't, that's not good. And we have a basic instinct about that. We don't just learn it by experience. There's some fascinating studies about infants even. And they do all kinds of things to try to, you know, block out, you know, this is just say like the color of the doll or the, but they do these experiments with dolls and things. And infants always choose the doll that acts rightly. Um, and they reject the doll that acts badly. And uh, this is as true as early as six months. And certainly studies of young people, young children, like two years of age, they have a basic moral sense that it's wrong to take things that aren't yours. Even if you go and you take your brother or sister's toy, you know it's wrong to do that, okay? Um, and I could go on, but there's a basic moral instinct that we call, this, uh, Thomas calls it syndaresis, which isn't a very helpful term, it's pretty abstract. Um, but basically sin means with, and deresis means what rectitude or rightness. So that we have a certain connection with what's right and with what's, what's wrong. Okay. 
It's just a basic instinct. Now, that doesn't mean some more technical things with the moral law, like I need to go to church every Sunday or that uh, I shouldn't eat meat on Friday or something. That, that Those things are less obvious. They need instruction. But basic moral norms, like not to fornicate, commit adultery, not to uh, murder or misrepresent or lie or, or uh, uh, take things that don't belong to you, that these are fundamentally basically wrong, okay? And even an infant can recognize that, all right? So um, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, anything about, about that? I mean, I mean, obviously, Paul says, have no part in this. Do not uh, be fascinated or listened to or be associated in, in any direct way with people who advocate such things. Um, um, you know, stay away from this. This is not of God. This is not of God. All right. Now, it goes on to maybe conclude this place, and then we'll get to a major controversy. Awake, O sleeper. For, uh, so for everything that comes, become, that everything becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine in you. In other words, no longer associate yourself with the deeds of darkness and with people who commit them, but rather let the light of Christ shine in you, the light of his truth. Now, look carefully then to how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best of these times because the days are evil. St. Paul says in Galatians chapter two that the Lord has saved us from this present evil age. Well, Father, um, I thought things were much better in the old days than they are now. You know, we can kind of, but remember the days are evil. The, this, we are living in a fallen world governed by a fallen angel and we have fallen natures, okay? Do not love this world. Do not emulate it. Do not adopt its priorities. Have little or nothing to do with it. We may need to make use of some of it for our needs, but be in the world, but not of the world, okay? Now, that doesn't mean there's never been a decent thought out there that isn't written in the Bible or whatever. But the point is that you be very, very careful because this world is largely influenced by the prince of this world, who is the devil. Okay? And if you want to go with what's popular and with, you know, with what's customary and what's, you know, the latest fad or fashion, beware. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger, Wilhelmina Robinson. Danger, danger, danger. Judge everything through your gospel glasses. Everything is discerned through this. But you see, people reverse it. Well, this is out of date. It's old fashioned. It's not what's current today. We need to change this because people aren't listening to this anymore. Do not be like them. Okay. This has stood the test of time. The latest fad or fashion is not. Okay. Recommend, recommend, rec as we say in the Spanish, if you help correct me, um, uh, Joy, recomiendo lo mucho. I, I, I recommend this highly. What, what, what if I, if I, is that decent Spanish or is that? Uh, that, was, that wasn't bad. It's lo recomiendo mucho. So you just have the, okay. the, the, the low part uh, in the wrong part of the word. But that was pretty good. You don't attach it at the end of there, you know. Recomiendo. Um, it depends. It depends, like, reco lo recomiendo. Okay. Um, but if you, because it's a, well, anyways, I'm not going to go into a grammar. Okay, no, no. Session, but, ah, was, but anyway, lo recomiendo mucho. Okay, I recommend it highly. Okay, this has stood the test of time. Lo recomiendo lo. Uh, no, lo recomiendo mucho. Okay, good. You sound like you want to put a little Italian twist on there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe no, so. I was going to say the same thing. It's not quite as musical as Italian, but it's it was yeah. very well said. I'm still father. All right. That's good. Yeah, joys are polyglot here she knows about four or five different languages all right now um uh, therefore do not be foolish but understand what is the will of the lord do not get drunk on wine that's debauchery but be filled with the holy spirit by the way they drank a lot more wine than we do why well you Was think it that as strong as as it is now well, they would often cut it with water, so maybe not. But, you know, a lot of wines, like a, a white Zinfandel only has 10% alcohol. You know, it's like a beer. 
that's not too but but anyway but but there are stronger wines i get i get you there but they would often cut the wine with a little bit of water remember how the priest puts a little water in the chalice that's an ancient practice where you pour out wine and cut it with some water why do they drink a lot of wine um okay. i think sanitation was an issue yeah who said that um crystal okay yeah <clears throat> crystal you're right uh, the idea of pure water is very modern and very Western, even right now in many parts of the world. Pure water is like, forget it. I mean, you take it out of the stream or the well, and it's coming up full of bacteria, full of uh, fecal matter. I mean, you name it. I mean, people, you know, are upstream washing their laundry in this stuff and throwing out their, throwing out their, uh, I'm sorry to put it the way, their, their uh, bedpans and into this water. And uh, it's full of uh, bacteriological matter, shall we say. Major biohazard. <laughs> and so uh, St. Thomas, I mean, St. Paul wrote, wrote to Timothy and said, Timothy, don't just drink water only. Drink some wine uh, to settle your stomach uh, and on account of your many illnesses, you know. Because, again, water, we think, is, is so pure and clean. Mm, it wasn't. And th that's not a, that's not, well... You, you can even just leave a glass of water sitting on your shelf for a day or two and start to see stuff starts growing in there. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's just a major area for biological life to multiply. And obviously because the water was often polluted by human activities upstream. So what they would do is they would actually drink a good bit of wine. So when he says don't get drunk on wine, doesn't mean don't drink wine at all, but he means don't drink to excess. But frankly, it was a common problem in the uh, Jewish world that by evening, people were, shall we say, a little happy. And they didn't um, make a lot of decisions in the evening. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you'll find examples where like Saul was, uh, when Saul was uh, in the evening after the dinner, he was merry with wine. Or when the apostles came out with Jesus after the Last Supper, they'd had four cups of wine because that's what you do in the Last Supper. And uh, let's just say they were a little sleepy in the garden. <laughs> no, I'm not trying to say they were all, all running around tipsy, but they would drink a lot more wine than we do, you know. So this isn't teetotaling stuff, but this is, you know, they knew too that you can drink more than you need. Okay. All right. Now. Um, they, waste, they wasted more as they drank too, didn't they? Probably. Yeah. Probably right. Yeah, because they needed it for real kind of medicinal purposes. And if you're just using it to get drunk, you're kind of wasting it. Yeah, exactly. Now, it says here, um, notice again, don't get drunk on wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Different kind of spirit, right? Spirits, the spirits of alcohol, the spirits of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Addressing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and, every, for, uh, to, and for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. All right, now here we come to a difficult passage. Uh, do we have the time? How do you all feel? Do you want to end here and pick up next week? What's your energy levels like? Or do you want to take on for another 10 minutes? Can you cover the pithiness? I can do pretty good. Coming up? quickly and then maybe we can return to it next week if you have questions okay the merits two times mm -hmm. yeah okay then um some people like to move verse 21 into the section about um wives and husbands submit to one another out of reverence for christ wives be submitted to your husbands and so on now even john paul and i i disagreed with pope john paul on this now he wasn't writing infallibly he was just writing his own opinion of it. He thinks that there's a mutual submission that Paul is talking about. I think he's wrong. And the reason I think he's wrong is he states a principle. Be submitted out of, uh, to one another out of reverence for Christ, by which I mean wives should be submitted to their husbands, children to their parents, and sadly, here at the end, slaves to their masters. Okay, So he, he talks about the order of submission. He doesn't just say everybody be submitted to one another. Because if everybody submitted, nobody submitted. Okay, so there's an order to submission. Now we don't like this word submission. First of all, let's look at it in its Latin root: sub meaning under, and emissio meaning mission or um, goal. 
you know. So um, now let's talk a little bit about there's a couple things to say about authority, and then we'll look at the text itself. In 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 modern in the modern world, we tend to look at authority or headship as about power. So if I have authority or headship or power, um, you know, I have power. I get to do what I want, and you have to do what I say. And so that's the idea. It's authority as power, headship as power, okay? Um, likewise, there's a, a mistaken idea that authority means somehow I'm better than you. But among Christians, authority is always exercised among equals. I may have some authority in a certain situation, and I may be under authority in other situations. So when I go to the pastoral center, I'm under authority to the bishop. He runs the meeting, whatever. Or even now, as pastor of this parish, I am under the archbishop's authority. I serve at his pleasure. However, in the parish setting, I have some authority um, as well, and I have to exercise it. But but it doesn't make me better than anyone or less than someone who has authority over me. Let's go right to the top. The Pope has authority in the church. Um, he has all these titles like pontific, pontificus, uh, you know, pontificus maximus, you know, um, you know, major, you know, these kinds of titles, vicar of, you know, blah, 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 blah. At the end of the day, I have a title too, Monsignor. Aren't you, aren't you impressed with that? But, you know, God does not call me Monsignor, I guarantee you. He calls me Carlito. Um, before God, I am no more or less than you. I have equal dignity. So the Pope has authority, but he is no more baptized than you or I. And his greatest title is not Pontific, you know, Pontifex Maximus. It's child of God, the same title you have. Okay. So authority is always exercised among equals, and it is not for power, but what? For service. So Jesus says in Matthew or Mark 10, for example, I'm just quoting from memory, but you've seen how those who have authority among the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones make their importance felt. It cannot be that way with you. But rather among you who wants to, those who are the greatest, in other words, who have authority, must serve, must become even the slave of all. For the Son of Man. You call me rabbi and teacher and master and Lord, for so I am. But the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for the many. So in other words, authority is not for power. It is for service. If someone has authority, they have it in order to serve. Let's all take a common example, a teacher in a classroom. She has authority. But she is no, you know, she is not, she, before God, she's no more or less than those children. And she has that authority to take care of them, to serve them. So now we close our math books and we're going to open up our science books. But she's, she has that and I say, I'm in charge and I'll do what I please and you better, you know, that's, that's not, no. She does that because she loves these children and wants to take care of them. All right. So authority is not for power. It is for service. Likewise, authority is always exercised among equals. With those two premises, let's look at this text. Wives should be submitted to your husbands as if to the Lord. Now, husbands, you're already on report. You're supposed to be like the Lord. Did you hear that? H wives, be submitted to your husbands as if to the Lord. Again, husbands, you're on report. Okay. Goes on to say here, for the husband is head of his wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and he himself is its savior. Now, Let's talk about headship for a minute. I got this thing called a body. I'm not talking about, you know, I'm talking about my physical body. And up right up here, there's something called a head. Now, if I had two heads, I'd be a freak. If I had no head, I'd be dead. So you see that every body, body needs one head. And this is a principle of, of human uh, organization. Um, in terms of our own bodies, but also then these other you know, more allegorical bodies that we call families or churches or governments or corporations or companies. Um, every company, if you will, needs one head. Now, that's usually necessary only when there's some dispute. 
Um, so for example, as the pastor of this parish, I seek to lead by consensus. I try to build consensus and get people on board. And, you know, I had a very contentious meeting tonight, but I tried to kind of pull all these threads together and get, you know, build some kind of consensus about what to do. So, um, but there's just going to be times when, you know, two different groups in the parish just won't agree. They want to use the same room at the same time, minor point, or there's some more serious matter. And I had to finally just call the shot. And I'll get killed by one side and loved by the other. Lousy being a leader. Um, but at the end of the day, um, headship is necessary. And that's true in families too. Most of the time, a husband and a wife um, can lead by consensus. They work together. They decide things together. But there are just going to be times when finally, even when a husband and a wife can't agree, when the husband has to finally call the shot and say, well, we're going to move from this place to another, or we're going to, you know, do this or not. And um, um, it's just the way things have to work. Otherwise, you just have endless power struggle. And that's very common today in marriages, because there's this rejection of headship or um, the idea that every body, including a marriage or a family, needs one head. Think of a referee on the field, you know, inbounds or out of bounds. So this referee comes over and makes the call. And whether you like the call or not, everybody agrees that when the referee makes the call, we have to accept it. And then the game goes on. Otherwise it's just fisticuffs and people coming out of the stands and fighting, you know, and the game can't go on. So these things are just a necessary part of human existence. So headship and the Bible consigns this to the husband. But the husband's on report because he's supposed to be like Christ who offered his life and sacrifice. So we see three things and I'll go through them quickly and we'll revisit them next week. But the husband is to love his wife, first of all, passionately. Okay, He is to love her in a purifying way and he is to love her in a providing kind of a way. So first of all, it says here, husbands, verse 25, right? Husbands. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That he, Okay, so the first thing is this word paradidomi. Here we had that same Greek word I mentioned earlier. He handed himself over. Christ loved his bride, the church, by handing himself over for her. He died so she didn't have to. He dies to, to, to uh, give her blessings. Um, and so we see that um, uh, his love... For his church is a sacrificial love, not a just a romantic or what I can get out of it kind of a love, an egocentric love. It is a love that is willing to lay down its life for the for the wife and children. Okay, and so the husband should be the first one to be willing to make a sacrifice. He needs to lead by example, living a sacrificial life, um, and making uh, you know I won't be able to buy the sports car I've always wanted because. One of our children is now sick and we need to cover medical bills. The car is history, that kind of stuff. Little things, big things. But a husband should love his wife and by extension, the children sacrificially, handing himself over, being willing to be crucified. And it isn't always the big stepping in front of a bullet so that the wife and children aren't killed. We'll all praise you at your funeral and you go out with glory. Great. But it's the death by a thousand cuts, the daily little sacrifices. The honey-do list. <laughs> but then, kind of stuff that comes up. And um, so the first thing is that a, a husband who has authority must use that authority in a, in a way where he loves his wife with and children with a passionate, that is to say, sacrificial love. Second thing, he is to love her in a purifying way. Now, here it says here that Christ sanctified the church in verse 26 having cleansed her with the washing of water and the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Now, in a certain sense, a husband can't sanctify his wife. That's God's job. She's probably already baptized. But the, what a husband can do is to say that my, my vocation, all the sacraments have this first goal, sanctification. So I need to help my wife and by extension, children, to grow in holiness. I need to set up a household 
and insist on those things that make it easier for my wife and children to live the Christian life than more difficult. Um, I'll give you some examples of this next week, but the idea is that you, you, you pray with your wife, you pray with your children, you read your children Bible stories, you share scripture with your wife, you, uh, you attend mass with her, you, you cherish her and love her, you encourage her in dark moments, and you listen to her as well, um, and give her consolation and encouragement, but you're a spiritual leader of your home. Most men, most husbands and fathers today are passive. The, the wife's really running the show. And on Sunday morning, if the, if the family goes to mass at all, it's the mother that drags the kids to church and the husband's sleeping in. He'll get up, buy some beer for the game and detail the car in the summer. You know, this is terrible. This is a complete role reversal. He should be the first one to be teaching the children the faith, right and wrong, confirming the mother's authority over her children, teaching them, reading them Bible stories and telling them this is the mind of God and I expect you to walk in it. So he used to be kind of a high priest of his household. You follow me? Now, again, like obviously a mother has great importance in this, but it shouldn't simply fall to the mother or the wife to read Bible stories and bring the children to church and make sure that they're, they're, you know, they're getting to their first confession or any of this kind of stuff. The husband should be the first one. Now, he may need help from his wife. That's a different question. But he has the first obligation. Okay. Finally, he should provide for his wife. It says here, um, he, he also, whoever loves his wife, I mean, in the same way, this is verse 20. I can't see it. My glasses aren't reaching. 20, 28? I think it's 28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives like their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as Christ does the church. Now, we'll just stop there for tonight, but here's what he's saying. Look, you and your wife, when you're married, have become one body. Now, if I'm hungry, I sure know how to find a refrigerator, sadly. If I'm cut or bleeding, I know how to manage that, and as best I can to stop the bleeding and bandage the wound or whatever. So I have an instinct with my own body that when there's a problem, I know how to take care of it. But a husband should have that same instinct with his wife and by extension, the children, because she is your body. Have you not read that the creator made them and that the two of them have become one flesh? See, they are no longer two. They are one flesh, one body. So as instinctive as you would be to take care, to feed your body when it's hungry, to give it rest when it's tired, to um, uh, assist it when it's injured, you should have the very same instinct for your wife and children. So this is, a, and again, a wife doesn't, and children don't just have physical needs like food or shelter or whatever, but there's spiritual needs, there's emotional needs, you know? Most wives, for example, need their, wife, their husband to encourage them. You're a beautiful woman, I'm glad I married you. Um, you're a wonderful mother. I, 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 I respect and reverence the sacrifices you make. I'm grateful for you. I love God. I'm praying for you. And before the children, you're, you're confirming her authority and say, don't you ever talk back to your mother. You'll answer to me for it. See? So this is what it means to help, you know, assist his wife in a providing kind of a way. So now here comes then the final thing and we'll end tonight. I think for most women I've talked to, not all, but most women, that if a husband's really living in this way, his headship, that they'd be more than happy to be submitted to that. Because, you know, again, he's living in a sacrificial life. He's, he's, he's also creating a climate in the home of, um, of a good spirituality. And, um, and then finally, he is, um, you know, doing, you know, his part in providing. And um, um, I can live with that. But it's this kind of, um, I think the feminist movement we have to accept as men didn't just come out of nowhere, you know, but basically that men in many cases were down on the job and misbehaving and there, there arose a movement, uh, maybe excessive in times, but there arose a movement among women that says, you know, this isn't working, you know, um, and whatever its excesses, I think that, that there, there may have been a kernel of truth in this, that a lot of men were kind of down on the job, okay, and had become passive and put a lot of burdens on women and didn't always love and respect them. Um, and um, 
So I think you, I hope you can see what a different picture this is that St. Paul paints than just, I'm in charge. <laughs> you got to do whatever I say. Some of you are old enough to remember Archie Bunker, you know, how he treated, you know, and he says, uh, you know, he says, hey, Dad, bring me a beer. Come on, Archie, you know, that kind of, that is not what Paul and the Holy Spirit have in mind. All right. It is a husband who loves his wife, cherishes her and the children, takes care of her, confirms her authority, um, assists her and takes his rightful role in helping to provide spiritual leadership in that home. OK. All right. So we'll end there for tonight. We'll kind of revisit this maybe next week a bit because it is controversial and there's a lot of cultural trappings and things that we're prone to uh, see this text in a, shall we say, a negative way. Okay. Anything quick, any quick questions before we end? You know, I, I think if this is one of the sad things about the text I just shared with you about why it's being submitted, the, art, the, the bishops of this country actually put brackets around it and said that it didn't have to be read on Sundays um, if it was too controversial. You know, what are we saying? That the word of God is just kind of wrong or inopportune? You know, but I think the challenge is to preach it correctly. You see, it's not just a husband should jab his wife in the ribs and say, see, I'm in charge. And the wife goes like this and rolls her eyes and everybody's tuned out is to look at what is this saying? It says, you're supposed to be like Christ, husband. How you doing? Okay. So anyway, I just at times... I'm amazed at just the cowardice of some of our bishops. But um, the entire bishops conference voted that this text is optional. Okay. Comments, questions? And we'll end with a prayer. All right. Wow. What a, what a quiet group tonight. Well, I'm surprised given the, the controversy of this text, but store up your questions for next week and pull your bow and arrow and let them go uh, when we're assembled next week. All right. I'm especially expecting to hear from some of you ladies about this text. All right, guys, you're on report. We're on report. All right. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we bless you. We thank you for this uh, powerful word from St. Paul, uh, summoning us to chastity and also then to great love for one another in the sacrament of holy matrimony and in our families. So we ask your mercy and your blessing, Lord, your grace upon us, that uh, we uh, who have heard this word may in fact be transformed by it, not just merely informed through Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good. We're getting close to, we're getting there through Ephesians, little by little. Poco a poco, piano, piano. Okay. And, and we found out how much you care about the Jesuits. <laughs> <laughs> There's one or two good ones out there, and I mean one or two. Okay. <laughs> all right. Blessings one and all, and we'll uh, see you next Monday. And uh, yes, all right. And Thank you so I'll much. Keep these opinions between you and me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Blessings, one and all. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Thank you Monsignor. Thank, Thank you, Monsignor. You.